First, I'd like to welcome Carmen Cardea, uh, CEO of ProMujer, uh, a lender and social enterprise advancing gender equality in Latin America. Gender has, sorry, <laughs> Carmen has more than 30 years of experience, um, including at the Inter-America Development Bank. Um, she's led organizations such as Endeavor in Uruguay, uh, Avena Foundation, um, before joining ProMujer seven years ago. So welcome, Carmen. Um, Ellie Turner is the Dep Deputy Agriculture Lead at 60 Decibels, um, where she supports impact investors and social enterprises um, uh, uh, and leads the company's work on climate resilience. Um, uh, Ellie has over 15 years experience working on development programs and impact evaluations, mainly in the Global South. Um, so, so welcome, Ellie. Uh, Marlene Molero Suarez, uh, co-founder and CEO of ELSA, um, a Lima-based startup that helps companies prevent workplace sexual harassment in Latin America. Um, Marlene is a labor lawyer and worked for more than 15 years as a lawyer and partner at a law firm in Lima, um, or Peru, Lima. Um, she teaches gender and labor law as well as leadership for women in the main law schools and business schools in Peru and has not one, but two TED Talks, um, which, which you also watch. Um, so, Carmen, um, I'd like to start with you, in part because Carmen and ProMujer were, what I believe was the center of the gender, gender lens investing world last week with their Glee Forum in Medellin in Colombia, um, which was, I was a fortunate to attend. Um, Impact Alpha was, was a partner. Um, there was conversations about everything and all things gender lens investing, but can you give us some of the highlights, uh, Carmen? Yeah, of course, and thank you very much, Dennis, for, for being there, for participating in the Glee Forum. Basically, the Glee Forum was last week in Medellin, in Colombia, more than 500 people attending the, the same from 24 countries. We did have more than 130 panelists. And actually, it was a great event that showcased that there are great opportunities in Latin America to invest with a gender lens. There is much to be done yet. But of course, we have to keep unlocking capital into Latin America with this gender perspective. We need also to be working in coordination with other organizations. We need to actually communicate much more the stories out there. We were able to take some of our beneficiaries to the event, so we were able to showcase those stories and the impact you can generate when you invest with a gender lens. So very happy to be here and very happy from Mujer on the results of the Glee Forum last week. Fantastic. Uh, and and ProMujer has perhaps one of the longest track records of investing in women in Latin America and lending to women. Um, how do you think about measuring your impact? Um, and, 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 and why do you, like, why would you focus on measuring that impact? For us, measuring is key. When you don't have data, when you don't have information, you cannot actually get to know the impact you are generating. So we are doing a great effort. We have a whole team looking into data, doing the assessment, and also we are working with third parties. For example, with 60 decibels. This will be the second year we have 60 decibels analyzing and doing an assessment on the different programs we have in place. So we are not only working with them, we are also working with microfinance rating for the financial services. So we are trying to keep up and get to know what is going on <clears throat> with the services we provide, the impact we are generating. And actually, we are trying also to keep up for example, reviewing the theory of change of ProMujer, getting to see the outcomes, the outputs, and getting to know if the KPIs we have in there are the right ones. So that is an ongoing exercise. As an, as an organization, we learn that we have to invest in measuring, and we are trying to do so. Can you give us example, uh, an example of how you use uh, data and, and then whether it's your theory of change or your lending operations, how you then use that to improve and, and drive more impact? Well, with the data, we get to know what is working, what is not working, the initiatives, if the initiatives we have in place are generating an impact, and that allow us to 
keep improving. That allow us to keep developing new programs, new services. With also uh, Marlene, we have been working with her internally at the at the organization. So to get to know internally what are the changes we have to make. So with our beneficiaries as, and internally as an organization, we keep actually using that data to keep improving. And, and this year you've launched uh, not one, but two gender bonds in Argentina. Gender bonds, which are um, institutional grade, allows you to tap um, local capital markets for, for capital to lend to female entrepreneurs. Um, how are you thinking about measuring the impact of those? Um, is it different than your other programs? And, it is. Actually, yes, we are very happy. We launched two gender bonds in Argentina. This, is, this was quite a big step for Promujar and for the whole impact investment industry because it's the first time that an organization, not, not the traditional organizations that go into the capital market, issues a gender bond. We were able to democratize the opportunity of anyone who wants to invest $300 to get into the capital market and invest in Promujer. On the other side, we are able to keep up with the, the, the financing needed for Promujer itself while we are securing that we are going to be able to deploy more funds for our beneficiaries. So basically, we are very happy with the bonds. We are going to be measuring the amount of, the, and the amount of loans we are providing, but we are going to be measuring also the number of women that can improve their living conditions with these loans. So we have a set of metrics that we are going to be measuring every th three months that actually we are going to be measuring and we are we have a university local university in argentina universidad 3 de febrero they are the ones also supporting us and measuring the impact we are generating thank you carmen um i'd like to bring in ellie um ellie we're talking about sort of pushing beyond standards but um can you help us set the baseline we'll, when we talk about emerging standards for gender lens, what, what is out there? What are, what are people doing as a sort of a baseline? Sure, so I think a lot of the standards that are out there are, so I guess I'll start by saying I love standards. They, standard metrics really help for comparability and accountability, and it's something that we really promote at 60 decibels. But I think the standards that are out there for gender lens investing are really about criteria and helping you identify which companies to invest in, but stop short of actually measuring the impact of those investments, right? And so you understand, okay, is this company owned by a woman? Does it employ women? Does it target women? Amazing, invest in those companies. But I think the next step where it really needs to go is to understand, okay, what is the experience of the women and is it really having that impact? And you can really only do that by collecting the data, by listening to the end stakeholders, by understanding, okay, great, 30% of the workforce is women, let's talk to them. Let's figure out what their experience is and let's improve that. Um, so I think a, a lot of the metrics that exist right now are really around sort of how you decide which companies to invest in and which really count as gender lens, but the next step is really measuring impact. Great, and maybe let's back up a bit and share specifically what you are doing to go beyond that, because I think it, it's super interesting and, and um, we should know more about it, but then uh, how you're actually doing it. Yeah, sure. So for anyone out there who doesn't know, 60 Decibels is a social impact measurement company. Um, and our methodology is really listening to end users and making it really easy for companies and for impact investors to get uh, the voice of the end beneficiary um, and incorporate that into their decision making. And so we do that through remote-based phone surveys. It's a really very, a very simple technology. Um, and, and we use standardized impact metrics that are not gender specific, but that are that are standardized for all impact investing, right? And so we look at the end user's quality of life or what their net promoter score is or how their life has changed. Maybe in, I work in agriculture, so we look a lot at how their income or their production has changed. And really the, the most important and it's extremely simple thing to do to understand gender is to disaggregate that data and look at the difference in all of those metrics between the two, two genders. And we have a way of sort of indexing that and looking at your gender experience score, which is on the top five metrics. What's the difference between the way that men respond and the way that women respond? And if women aren't responding in the same way as men, you have a problem. And, and it's really, it, it 
clearly sort of illuminates that, that something isn't working and where you need to dig deeper to make sure that women are experiencing the same, if not a greater impact than men. It's funny, you think impact investors, are, they care about the impact of their investment, they'd be actually speaking to, to the, the humans on the end of, of that investment, but it's, not, it's actually not fairly common. Um, and, and so I wonder if you could share how um, investors or, or businesses are using that type of data um, to improve their, improve their performance. Sure, so I mean, it, it is becoming a lot more common, I think. Um, it's something that, that we've worked hard on, but you're right, not, not everyone does it. And so um, the, they use it in two ways, right? So usually it, it can be used to demonstrate your impact, which is often the interest of the investor. It's often in the interest of the company if they're trying to raise capital from an impact investor. Um, but then on the other side, it's really about improving a product. So understanding what are the challenges faced specifically by women, um, maybe that men aren't facing, and using that to improve your product. And so, you know, for example, we, are, we work with like a advisory service that provides information to farmers in Ethiopia about, you know, when they should plant and how they should treat their cows and all of the things that you give advisory services on. And um, we did a study and found out that, you know, men were more likely to respond to the messages. They are more likely to be the phone owners. They were more likely to then take up the practices that were being recommended. And what that means is then they are more likely to increase their production and get the earnings and have control of those earnings. Um, and so what they did when they received the data and, and these insights was to really, okay, how do we design this in a way that can reach more women? Um, it has to, you know, let's, let's focus on the sort of secondary listeners and promoting listening to it on a speakerphone with your whole family or in a community or doing the calls at a time that work better for women or making those calls shorter so that they're not as disruptive to the household duties or just different things that you can change about a product with those insights once you really understand how that end user is actually using it. And it you, you've done some, I know I've seen some of the, the reports on agriculture in, in other areas. What, do, what is 60 Decibels doing around women and gender um, and, and how's it thinking? that as a practice? Sure, so I mean, we, we think about it in terms of the needs of our clients who are, are impact investors and, and businesses, and it's really sort of two, two different things. One is what I've been describing so far, which is really just understanding that differential impact if, in order to just be gender aware and understand how women are experiencing it versus men, and that's just what I've described, which is disaggregating the data and digging into the differences. I think the sort of next level is those businesses that seek to transform gender in some sort of way, right? So to build agency, to empower women. And so we're incorporating these different kinds of questions and metrics and sort of modules that you can use on top of these customer experience surveys to really understand, okay, has a woman's decision-making power in the household changed? Has their experience at work changed or, or whatever it is that that um, business is aiming to do, but those are all really tailored to, I mean, they're, they're standardized and they're tailored, right? So you choose the ones that make sense with your impact thesis. Um, and those take longer to impact, right? Like they, they take longer to, to realize. So it takes, it takes longer and you should use those types of things later in, in the life, whereas I think that the experience differentials you can catch sooner. Great, thank you. Um, Marlene, um, you were also in Medellin, Medellin last week. Um, uh, what were your takeaways from a, from a data or impact standpoint? What was the discussion about? Well, thank you. And um, yeah, very glad to, to be here. And um, my, my view was there was an evolution on, on evaluated impact with gender lens investing. For me, the traditional has been, for instance, to know the, the team you are founding or the team you are investing in, how it is disaggregated by gender. That would be like very traditional. And then still it's something like lots, the only thing lots of investors do, very traditional, but still what lots, the only thing they do. Then the second would be what are you doing with your, with your initiative, your program, your startup or whatever to be founded and who are the final beneficiaries of that? And I think that's also a traditional viewpoint and that's how it's been going on. But then I think that in the discussion within the Glee, I. I actually saw two new approaches. One was the strength of intersectionality within the discussion. And when it was not on the panel, 
someone was raising the question in the public. So I think this is something that is coming and coming and should be coming even, even more because we tend to talk about gender as synonymous of women, first mistake, and the second one is we only talk about women as we are like one, one type of women with one kind of characteristics and one time of, of needs or, or whatever. And, uh, and the second um, the new you know, standpoint, uh, viewpoint I, I actually saw, it's uh, how, how you look at the teams you are investing in. And, and that's where we come, for instance, with, with ELSA. What ELSA does is that we help organizations prevent sexual harassment at work, and we measure it in an anonymous way, so we don't wait for a claim or a report to be filed, but we ask everyone in the organization. And that is something you, you can take care as an investor in the teams you are investing in. How is, that, okay, you look at what the impact on, on the public or on the clients you are working with is, but you usually don't look at the impact within your own team. So that's something new, something we do, but something I also saw was being talked about within the Glee. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And the, the ELSA specifically helps women empowers women to, to, to prevent um, or, or, or address sexual harassment in the workplace. But how are company, tell us a bit more about how companies are using it to prevent, and, and the data they're using to prevent um, sexual harassment in the workplace. We actually, what we do is we work with organizations that most of them come from the private sector, but we have also interventions with public sector, with nonprofits, and also international organizations. We have worked with all those kind of four organizations. And uh, we measure it. We have a two-entry uh, information tool. It's a B2B SaaS. It's a software, and it collects data in an anonymous way. And it uh, asks questions, and the questions vary depending on your previous answer. So it gives metrics on the real incident of sexual harassment at work. For you to have an idea, only 1% of people that go through sexual harassment actually file a report. And the incidence it's about 35% on average. If it's women, it's around 40%. If it's people from the LGBT community, uh, it's uh, more like 50%. So it's re there is a real gap between the information the organization gets through the whistleblower lines, for instance, and what actually is going on within the organization. So this data is used to automatically create an hyper-personalized action plan for each organization. So what we are actually doing is using data to create a strategy. And that, as with probably a lot of other things, works. So we have reduced the incidence of harassment by 60% in the organizations we have been working with. And it, that's because the initiatives or actions they are taking are, are you know, more, more effective and, and more efficient because now they have the information to do what actually works. And the other thing is that with ELSA, I mean, the main affected ones by sexual harassment still are women, but we also, we also cut by age, for instance, so it actually affects more younger women within the workforce. Uh, it affects more Afro-descendant women as well, and the manifestations or expressions of harassment are more focused on the body, for instance, so the way it's manifested actually changes. We, actually, we also focus on, on economic vulnerability, so those, ones, for instance, who earn less than $330 a month uh, are more exposed to sexual harassment as well. And also we focus mostly in LGBT communities. So we, we not only go through women, but we have several cuts. To, so this is information as well for organization to be able to look out and, and target more their actions. I'm just realizing now we have Gender Lab up there, but they've been, you've rebranded to Elsa. Yeah. What, what, was, what, was, what is it? What's the acronym? The ELSA, it's for Espacios Laborales Sin Acoso, which would be workplaces free of sexual harassment. Um, the, there was a very public, prominent incident of, incident of sexual harassment at the, World, the Women's World Cup this year with the Spanish director of football. Um, he had a great, I think, way of thinking about that and talking about how data could actually explain exactly what happened when that incident caused so much confusion have different opinions, but talk about how you think how data helps explain. What, one thing we like a lot about data, when, when we run ELSA within an organization, something we, we look forward to do is to talk to people in leadership positions, because then it stops being Marlene thinks this, 
because it could be Marlene, it's too sensitive is the right word, right? It's, it's yeah, too yeah. sensitive for, for this, or maybe she's just imagining. And then you change that sentence for 35% of the people working in business organization thinks that, you know, that making an homosexual joke is no longer a joke. Th things like that. So the message, message goes a lot clearer. And that also helps to explain things like what happened in the Female World Cup. And, and all the debate that went around. So if you remember what happened, I mean, he kissed her, right? And um, when she was receiving the, the cup or she was receiving her, her medal, and there was a whole debate within the social media. And some of the evidence he was providing to claim he was innocent, for instance, was a, a recording for the, within the airplane when they were returning home and they were like celebrating and they were also making jokes about the, the kiss. So they were saying, like, why she's making jokes or the team is making jokes around the kids if she's then going to, to file a report. And, well, nine out of ten people do not understand what sexual harassment at work is, even if we are talking about manifestations that involve bodily contact, you know, as our, our unwanted sexual attention, as is the, the act of the kiss, which is a physical act, but still... Nine out of 10 have problems acknowledging that could be a way of sexual harassment. And then people started saying like, well, why uh, she didn't file the report immediately? Why she, she waited for, for some days, one or two days? And the other thing is they were saying is, and he was saying it as well, is why she didn't reject him when, when he, he kissed her and then one, and actually came from one member of my family, said, yeah, well, before kissing her, she actually carried him, you know? So if she carried him, why, why wouldn't she be expecting to be kissed, something like that? Well, three out of four people, 75%, put the responsibility of the harassment on women, on doing something to provoke it or in not stopping it. So the data shows, I mean, or helps to explain everything that has been going on on the debate, where we are as a society or as a global population, really, about, about the problem. So it's focusing on the root causes. And if you focus on the root causes, then you can address them. Because it's okay to, to focus on the cases that have already happened. You have to attend them and remedy them. But you also have to focus on prevention, because you have to stop those things from happening, and from that you need to address root causes. Thank you, love that example. Um, if, we're gonna move to Q&A in, in a bit, so if you have questions, um, put them, just think about them, and we'll, 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 we'll just call on you in, in a moment. Um, but Carmen, uh, you mentioned your, your work with 60 decibels, I think we learned in, in our prep calls, there was a lot more collaboration here than, than we realized. Um, can you share a bit about each of the projects you're working with 60 decibels and Elsa? Yeah, basically, and, and Ellie will, will be able to share much more than me. But basically, when we were analyzing Promujer, we were trying to analyze, okay, the grants you provide, what type of impact they are, those grants are generating in those women, in their families. They have improved, actually, their living conditions. What else they have done? What, what is the baseline on when you provide a loan what are you providing besides that loan? You are providing education. So what is the impact of those programs? What is the impact on other type of services that we provide? But Eli, I don't know, maybe you want to share a little bit more about the, 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 the measurement you, you did with Promujer. Yeah, I mean, I think just the, the one key thing to add there is that you know, with, with microfinance, we're able to do a, a microfinance index where we're able to look at borrowers uh, across the whole world that are participating in different microfinance organizations. Um, and we measure these impacts across 100 different MFIs, and so it's really uh, special to be able to see, okay, here's a performance benchmark. We've asked this question to thousands and thousands of individuals who are borrowing, and we can then see sort of how these women that are receiving that, that loan for Puma Hair compared to this overall experience that on average a borrower would have with an MFI. And that just sort of speaks a little bit to the power of standards and, and standardization um, when we do these types of assessments. So that was sort of an external, using a, a partner for external 
understanding external impact, and also I believe is more internal look at, at, at Puma Hair's operations. Yeah, in the case of ELSA, we did apply ELSA in Bolivia. So we did, it's where we have more employees. We have more than 900 employees in Bolivia. So we did a huge assessment there. And well, we, we are trying to improve the things that with Marlene, we, we found that there are things that we can keep improving internally. I don't know, Marlene, maybe you want to share a little bit of that assessment. No, this is a great experience we had in, in Bolivia with 20, 20 organizations. One of them was actually, it was in, indeed uh, Pura Mujer. And I think it's very important because more and more organizations uh, have a gender practice, d &I, you know, in, in improvement practice. Sometimes it has to do with the heart of the core of, of the business or, or what the organization does, and it's the case of Pura Mujer. But that doesn't mean you have a perfect and safest environment. You, you still have to, to work because society happens. Something we have seen with a lot of ELSA's organizations before they join ELSA or a new organization that is talking to us is somehow they, came, they, they think that what happens in the world, in society, in, in Latin America, which is very majestic, doesn't happen within their organization. Somehow society hasn't managed to get within the organization. That's impossible. So they, it's it's uh, it, it's I I admire a lot of organizations that go through ELSA because it, it takes a lot of courage to actually ask the people what you were mentioning Ellie. With it's like they are growing and growing on that practice. But usually, what you focus on is in your output. What policies do you have? You you have a whistleblower line or not? And that's it. Do you train your employees? That's it. But you don't see the impact of those measures or actions you are taking. So it's more like that way, it's just a compliance check, but the compliance is meant to cha change things, really. More actionable. Yeah. Uh, Ellie, perhaps this is a question for you. The, 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 coming back to the, uh, the, the emerging standards, what do we think they're getting right or wrong? Or what would, you, at an industry level, you'd like to see more of? I mean, I think I sort of already answered this, but um, I mean, what I'd like to see more of is more about the the woman's experience, whether it's, I mean, we have these categories of criteria that have to do with, okay, maybe you're targeting women's leadership, or maybe you're targeting the woman as the consumer or the woman as the employee, but there are not yet, that I'm aware of, standard metrics for what that female experience should be as an employee or as a consumer or what you want to hear back from them. And so I think that that is sort of the, the next step and the next gap that, that remains to be seen. Carmen, uh, working with outside investors or funders, um, are you? What is your experience with so-called standardization or expectations for reporting? Um, some, is there sometimes a misalignment between what they're asking and what you're what you'd like to be collecting or what you could be? Well, basically, the investors are requesting more data. The investors are requesting us to be measuring much more the impact. It's not enough to actually state, okay, I'm delivering. 150 loans, okay, what, what is the impact of those loans? What are you achieving with those loans? What's, what are those women achieving with those loans? So we have to be very well aware of that. And basically, in some cases, what it's important actually to be kind of aware is that you have to invest to measure. And we need, we are doing a great investment in setting up the team that is doing that assessment, in actually hiring someone at 60 decibels or others. So you need to invest, and in that investment, it will actually allow you to get access to new investors and will allow you to get access to showcase your success story. So it's an, a worthwhile investment you, we have to do as, or, as organizations. In some cases, yes, you will find investors that would like you to be much more in the, in, in the, in the type of data you are gathering, but you have to negotiate as always. <laughs> At some level, though, you're also saying it costs money to do this type of evaluation, and impact investors and funders should be aware of that when they're with their own expectations. Yeah, and actually, they should, someone should be paid also for that type of investment. We are willing to do an investment, but 
also we have to be looking for someone else to support us as organizations to, to do that investment too. Great, so let's open it up for questions. Is there right here, ma'am? Um, hi, my name is um, Jeanette Gurung, and I, we run a standard for women's empowerment, which none of you seem to be aware of, which is so frustrating to me, as always. Um, about eight years ago, we designed the W plus standard, and we did so in a way that not only measures and quantifies impact for women's empowerment, but monetizes it. And the intent of that was to provide as, as just as, as Carmen said, it costs money to measure. And so we're trying to provide a market-based way to, one, incentivize projects, not, not necessarily companies, could be companies, to do more for women's empowerment, number one, and to generate revenues that would also pay for the, that measurement cost, as well as pay for additional activities for women's empowerment. And three, most importantly to my organization as a not-for-profit, is that we require at least 20% of the value of the credits that are generated, that are W plus credits sold on the market, at least 20% of that must be provided as a payment to women's organizations inside the project that's being measured. Um, and just, I could go on and on, I will not. We have a website, we have a lot of information about us. Um, we were in the IRIS approved network of standards, but Somehow people keep overlooking us. Um, we work with the World Bank, work with the Gates Foundation and many others. Um, and also I think we have a way to uh, use a methodology jointly with a, climate, with a carbon standard and a carbon methodology so we can label a carbon offset uh, with a label for women's empowerment and it achieves a higher premium price for that. So thanks very much. Thank you. No, it's interesting because we hear about Carbon credits all the time. Have, have you all come across? Gen Gender's a co-benefit. Gen gender credits can be a co-benefit of a carbon credit. Oh, yeah. Okay, co-benefits. Co yeah. uh, is this something you all have seen in, in, in the marketplace? I have not. No, but it's super exciting, and I've seen it sort of obviously with carbon, but with other impacts as well. This idea of monetizing specific impacts. Um, which I think is super cool. I think you have to really, you know, put a value on something that you want to achieve, um, and passing it on to the consumer I think is always a, a great idea. So super excited to learn about that. Um, any other any other questions? Oh, right there, yeah. Right away. So how do you think about the element of time and how you measure impact and what are proxy metrics that you can use in the time when you do create an investment if you don't see the impact right away, especially because the time frame investments are super long? Sure. So I think it really it depends on the investment and the impact you're trying to achieve. And so usually the first thing we'll do is we'll sit down with the investor in the business and say, like, what's your impact thesis? What's the expected time that you would anticipate that it would take to achieve that and from there we can sort of back out are there intermediate outcomes that we would want to see sooner or should we just wait one year two years three years to do this study when we think that something could happen but i think it really is completely dependent upon what the intervention is um, as to what the what the early proxies of success would be I have a follow-up question for Ali as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We've talked a lot about um, the standard, and you talked about the gap to, you know, what phase two might look like. Um, I'm curious if you have an idea of what that um, kind of like north star in that second phase would be. It seems like you've been thinking about this for a while. So you talked about the experience of an employee or a leader in the space. Like, what is the north star of that experience? a great question. Um, again, I think there are there's probably a different North Star for different categories of investment, right? So like women's empowerment is one dimension. And so that is probably 
th those metrics are probably that North Star there, but s other, you know, gender lens investments are really focused on something that's completely separate from empowerment and so would need a different North Star. And so I think what I would like to see, you know, at the end is maybe a, a set of two or three metrics and five categories each or something of, of what are these buckets that investments are getting toward and is it the employee experience? Is it the, the women's empowerment and decision making in a household? Um, or is it something else? Um, and then having specific metrics about the woman's experience for each of those buckets, I think. I don't know if you, you guys are welcome to chime in if you have a North Star. Hi, thank you for uh, this interesting conversation. I'm, um, I work in gender-based violence, um, and gender-based violence is usually uh, unintended consequence of something else. And so there are cases where impact investors come into communities, and I work a lot in indigenous communities, um, with new investments, which increases uh, economic well-being, um, and then increases issues um, around that, it, alcohol, drug use, and so on. Um, as an impact investor, if your focus is economic well-being, you're not thinking about those issues. And you're definitely not paying for that kind of assessment of potential negative consequences. So my question, I guess, is are there other players in the field um, that could step in and try to measure that, monitor that, help with some of the cost and time that's involved? In, 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 in looking at those potential negative consequences. In our case, we pay a lot of attention to gender-based violence because actually we, we are very well aware of when you empower women, you get to empower her, she will play a totally different role at the family level. So she could be seen as the person who comes with that needed income and she will be like at the, in a pedestal but on the other side, she can be seen as someone that can get out and she will be suffering gender-based violence. So we, we keep track of that. We are very well aware. We have in place different programs to support women to identify what is gender-based violence because actually most of these women associate gender-based violence when, with, with a punch. But there are different, you know more than me, that there are various different ways of suffering gender-based violence. So we are very well aware of that and we keep track of that. That is one of the key things that we keep track of. I said, I mean, gender lens investing, yeah, I think these are very clear cases of that, but I feel like there's investors that aren't necessarily investing in women, for example. And this is a case where maybe adopting a gender lens when you're not investing in, in women, you're investing in other things, could um, surface some of those issues. Please. Hi. Um, at this conference, we've, we're in a community that embraces gender lens investing. We embrace investing in diversity. I'm just curious, um, given what's happening, particularly in the US right now, with the lawsuit that happened against Harvard, um, to kind of about reverse discrimination. How, is, how do you all see that you as, whether it be gender investors or working in the gender space, are gonna navigate that? Um, they're currently, that same organization went after Harvard is now going after Fearless Fund and also making any windows about going after others that are a Fearless Fund, just if you don't know, they. They fund in women entrepreneurs, black women entrepreneurs. So again, it's, I mean, if any community there is to figure out how we're going to navigate this, I'm just curious what your perspective is on that and what you see, how it, you see it unfolding. So you're referencing the Supreme Court decision against affirmative action. Correct. And feels on, I think. In and both, as it starts going into our space. That's true, it's the res, but those, to be clear, those were race-specific decisions. Correct. Um, but your question is how is our other And what's to stop it from being a slippery slope yeah. into gender investing? Wait, I'm gonna go. 
you, yeah, yeah. please. <laughs> <laughs> I can go from two viewpoints because I'm a startup, so I receive investment, and I also work with companies that are multinational. Some are, you know, headquarters based in the U.S. and they have DNI programs and initiatives, and they are being sued. So those, you know, that's like another backlash the of that. The corporations are the being sued. The corporations are being sued again because of those programs. And then as an entrepreneur, and I'm a Latino founder, so sometimes I, you know, can benefit from 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 funds that, that uh, are directed towards Latino founders or women or things like that. Um, some there, I think there there was a panel. I think it was it was yesterday within the DNI track. And they're already allocating funds because they they are anticipating they are going to be to be sued. So probably there's going to be an extra backlash in this environment. And I'm from Peru, so I'm, I work in Latin America. And then the backlash is also felt there. We don't have your the, the U.S. like legal system that it goes through through rulings. We have mostly things going through laws. But then we have parliaments and then we have congresses that are starting to ban initiatives that were promoting quotas or things like this. And they are using the Supreme Court ruling as, as one of their arguments. So the backlash is, you know, going out of the U.S. as well. And in different fields, not only in, in impact investment, it's going, you know, everywhere. Uh, this is an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a question for the panel. So uh, over the course of a lot of uh, gender-based programming over the last 30 years in sustainable development initiatives, there's been, uh, as you've all noted, an increased realization that if you focus exclusively on women, that there is this massive backlash. Uh, and so really the new emphasis, or not so new now, it's been, you know, good 10 years is that really you need to be including everyone in the family. Uh, and uh, that has been an evolution of, of learning. So uh, I'd love to hear the perspectives from anyone on the panel as to um, how and whether you would see maybe a family-based approach uh, that is not unintentionally excluding uh, uh, men or husbands in, in this particular uh, equation so that there is uh, buy-in and therefore uh, genuine empowerment of women uh, rather than seeing that empowerment as a threat. Interesting question. Basically, men are usually the ones who have access to different, specifically when we, we are speaking about financial services. So we are the ones excluding usually from the financial services. We are the ones that require that access, and we are concentrating our efforts on giving women the access to the funds they need to develop their own businesses, to have access to different type of services. So basically, it's not excluding men, but trying to give women the access to the services they don't have. So it's kind of, we are half of the population, and we are actually only 6% of the funds invested in Latin America are going to women-led companies. So 94% of the funds are going to men-led companies. So we have to change that equation. So it's not kind of leaving the men out. Actually, we are the ones out of the equation. We need to include much more women. I interviewed a, an entrepreneur at, at a forum last week um, who was exclusively lending to women, and he, part of his pitch is that they'll, then they employ the husband. Once they have once they have money, they create businesses that employ the husband. There is a knock-on effect. Um, other questions? I can take it. I've, I've, I've alluded to it a few times. Um, we, we have adopted it at 60 Decibels, and we, have, we are members of 2X, and we've helped other companies to adopt it. Um, but again, it's criteria, right? It is not impact measurement, and so it helps you, what I said at the very beginning, it helps you figure out what is 
a gender lens investment and am I making one? And it helps get some of the data from the companies you're investing in, um, but it doesn't measure impact. Um, so I think, you know, we, we need to do both. But it's a good baseline. It's As a you great were baseline. Saying, it's it's a, a good baseline. And basically, they are also working on a certification. So I think that it will help the industry to set that baseline. But as Eli was stating, it's not kind of measuring the impact itself, but it's very much needed. Hi there. Hi there. Um, yeah, I was curious if uh, talking through kind of the beyond metrics, um, looking at the kind of whole architecture for, for measuring impact, if you, you could share maybe an example or, or had any thoughts about what would be, you know, an, an excellent model for, for um, where you see uh, this, you know, next generation uh, of impact measurement with, with the gender lens, um, looking from kind of the different strands that, that you've been mentioning around data, around institutional incentives. Um, is, there, is there a firm or is there a, an emblematic case out there that, that really exemplifies uh, where the industry should be moving towards, and um, and kind of what are those those key enabling factors uh, uh, across like a you know architecture for for measuring impact? Sure, we need to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have a great like example, but I can I guess I can say that the thing that I would want to see in the next generation would be similar to what I would want to see for all impact measurement, which would be that the investors in the companies make it a part of their day-to-day -day operation, their regular business operations to understand the voice of the end beneficiary. And so like Carmen was talking about how hard it is to get the resources to do the impact studies. And that's because it's still like as far as we've come, it is still not something that is baked into the investment. It's something you're either doing through like a grant or like a special technical assistance facility or like, you know, it, it's not something that it, it's, it's not like accounting that like every business has to do. And it should be accounting, right? Like there should be a function or should, there should just be a line item where you just every year, every two years, you check in with your end users and you say, how's your quality of life? How are things going for you? What challenges are you facing? Um, that's, that's what I would want to see. And it's not gender specific, of course, but I'll see what you guys yeah, I totally agree. And, and we need to keep standardizing. We need some methodologies out there that we can all use and hopefully open and for free at some point. But of course, we have to be very open also to be and keep adjusting ourselves to what it's needed because non program is the same as the other one. So it's kind of very difficult. You standardize and you have a baseline. But on the other side, you will have totally different programs out there. So it's kind of adjusting yourself to measuring your impact according to what your organizations, your objectives are. Yeah, I would add something there. I think it would be sound obvious, but to, to really be aware of what impact means and not confuse it by, by output, but real impact which is, is Ellie's, I think, uh, Ellie's point. So what are the, the, the changes in the lives of the end users and to ask the end users as part of, of that, then I will expect not only the, I will expect donors, for instance, or the ones that are providing the resources to, to ask for, for those kind of studies as well, for instance, so, so it's like our encouragement system. And I would expect to, for gender to be part of all the impact measurements, that it's like a must do because it's half of the population and uh, their lives and, and the things they go through and the impact is different with them. And when we don't put a gender lens perspective there, then, then you know, contra things that we were not me meant to happen can happen. Marlene, you mentioned in our, our prep sessions that um, your, some of your data is being used for research here in the U.S. and, and elsewhere. Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, we, we, we actually hold the biggest uh, data set of sexual harassment at work within Latin America um, in big corporations. That, that's the, the scope. 
and we have like 110,000 data entry points. So it's, it's really big, it's the biggest at least in the Latin American region. And uh, it doesn't exist in the US as well. The samples, the, the, the papers in the US use are 1,000 or, or 2,000. So we are partnering with academics from Stanford, with Berkeley and Washington University, and students from data analytics or people analytics or researchers are using the data to create knowledge. That is also the purpose of a tool as we have. We have the data open for researchers and translated into English if anyone is interested uh, as well. It, it's available for research. And with that, we expect also to impact in social policy, in public policy. I mean, because sometimes the, the law, if we talk about public policy as materialized within law, it has some solutions, but if those solutions are only legal and they are not changing or serving the people they are supposed to serve, they are not good. So with our data, we can also uh, modify things or suggest things that are po to policymakers. As a baseline, my recommendation would be pick up four, no more than four KPIs. So find those that will really showcase the impact you're generating and try to actually gather the information for those. Then you can go much more in depth. Whatever you can invest, it will be more than, than, than what you are doing right now. But basically, the, you can start with three, four KPIs, and then you will be investing. I don't know, Ellie, maybe you will probably. Yeah, I mean, I think the question about alternative methodologies, like there are definitely methodologies out there that are like modeling using predictive analytics to say what your impact could be. But I've never seen one that's like a, like a user-friendly tool that anyone could access, right? It's actually like a pretty in-depth process to go through like all of these assumptions about the context that you're in um, and the markets that you're serving and all of this. So it's a, it's a great idea. I think I would love to see it developed, but it's not something that I personally am working on or am aware of. And it actually depends on the amount of data you have. Because we, we do it, we have the amount of data to, to, do it, to predict with 85% of accuracy, and still there is a 15% gap and we have a lot of information. And, and if you have like less data entry points, your accuracy is like 70%, 60 something percent. And also the, the population you're measuring or the context has to be kind of homogeneous as well. And, and I guess that the kind of projects you, you measure or you, or you do are not necessarily the, the, the rule. But I do think that technology it is bringing a lot of, of new possibilities and, and solutions. So, so probably there is something not as accurate as we would like to, but something that would uh, lower the costs, maybe. I mean, I'm a startup, and uh, if, if you were a founder, only 1% of the BC funds would be for, for you, would be available for you. And it's, I mean, and, and the VCs, they increase in, they, I mean, if you ask a VC now how much of your portfolio has female founders, for instance, just female founders, now they know the answer. And, and if you ask that question, like, three years ago, they, they would have to start, you know, counting in their minds while, while trying to answer. So, so at least now, and it's a very poor at least, I'm sorry, <laughs> they are counting. Uh, but, but then... You know, sometimes they say like 15% or something like that. And then they say, but there are not enough female founders, so they're not like BIPOC founders or IPOC founders or things like that. And, uh, but uh, the LPs, the ones that are giving the money to the VCs, that's how, it, that's how it works, are starting to ask more and more for how or in whom they are investing. So what I think is going to happen for VCs at least, for venture capital, and for impact investors, I think it's, you know, it, they are more advanced within this path, but the other ones are way behind, that they, they, they have to report. So they are being obliged by the ones that are giving them money to report, and that's a change. Uh, I think they are going to, to be, to have, to, to have transparency practices and, um, and of course, then you have the impact thing on the startups. And yet that's, that's going to be hard to, to measure again and 
with the startups is going to happen. For instance, we measure, but because our tool measures, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's part of what we do. But for other startups, it doesn't work like that. So it's going, I think, to happen the same as in his pro mujer. It's going to cost you need resources to, to fund the measuring of the impact, or, uh, or you need an investor to go through 60 decibels, for instance, to measure the impact on a startup they, they have funded or want to fund or, or things like that. So it's going to happen the same here. Yeah, and I think that we have to change our mentality. We, we don't have to see measurement as a cost. It's an investment. If we measure, whatever we measure, we will be able to change, to adjust, to actually showcase the impact. So it's, for us, it's an investment. We are investing a lot of money, but it's a, a good investment. It's those type of investment that we need to, to fulfill. And then just to respond quickly on the, the idea of time, because it's a, it's a great point. You're exactly right, and it's something we really designed our model around, and it actually goes back to the theme of standard metrics, and it, it is the reason that doing a study with us doesn't take very much time on the, count of, on the part of the founder of the management team. I mean, if Promo Harris signs up for a study, let me tell you, this is the MFI survey, and we spend an hour on the phone, you give us phone numbers, and then we say, go run your business. We'll, we'll do this, and we'll talk to you in 12 weeks, and then we'll show you the results. But it's very much designed from the perspective of like, this is what we do. This isn't what you should have to do. You don't have time for this. We've standardized it. We've made it super easy for everyone. Now, we certainly get partners who like want to brainstorm metrics with us for hours and hours, and we're happy to do that too. And do the theory of change and do all the things, but it's not required, right? Like we have developed these standard metrics for different industries and across all of them so that you can just sort of have like an off the shelf impact study um, without it taking a ton of your time.